Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa Nicoletti. Um, I'm here representing Releve Sports Medicine. I'm just going to give it a few more minutes to get everyone on board, and then we'll start going over some information, and then we will begin with our presenter. Okay, so just give it a little bit more time, please. And if you guys have any issues or connection or questions or anything, um, you can just write something down in the questions box and I will try my best to assist you. I am not super savvy with computers, but I will do my best. I'm just going to get two more minutes and then we'll get started because, you know, everyone probably has somewhere they would like to be after this. <clears throat> All right. Okay, everyone, I'm going to begin. I'm just going to read some information for you all. Um, to everyone who is new here, my name is Melissa Nicoletti, um, Dr. Melissa Nicoletti, sorry. And I would like to welcome you all to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. Uh, for additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar, or you can sign up for the email list to be notified on upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our schedule, so check back often. This video will be available for review after this journal club. The information in the video content represents the views and opinions of the presenters and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Releve Sports Medicine. The mere appearance of video content on the website does not constitute an endorsement by Releve Sports Medicine or its affiliates of such video content. The video content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The video content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have 
regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've read or seen on this site. Relevay Sports Medicine hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content, which is provided as is and without warranties. We are looking for an athletic trainer to join our team. This is a full-time clinic-based position working in a sports medicine clinic. Please feel free to pass our information along if you know of a qualified candidate. More information regarding applying can be found on our website. Now, for all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the BOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz, evaluation, and assessment. You have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from Customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done to receive your statement of credit. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, if you don't receive the follow up email or have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, as I stated before, you can submit the question and we will review questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left um, and the slides should become visible. The recording will be available for review from our website tomorrow. Okay, with all of that said, I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Our speaker um, is named Naomi Mark. Naomi has been a physical therapist for 10 years working in the outpatient setting and has owned Bodies in Motion Physical Therapy located in Maui, Hawaii for the past three and a half years. Throughout her career, she has worked with patients of all ages and activity levels, ranging from professional athletes to weekend warriors, pediatrics to geriatrics. Along with physical therapy, she coaches uh, high school and youth springboard diving. She has been a lifelong athlete herself as a competitive gymnast in her youth, a collegiate diver and pole vaulter, and currently a marathon runner and a master's diver. So with all that said, I am very excited to introduce Naomi Mark to our journal club as our speaker. I am gonna turn over to her um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the question box. And at the conclusion, I will make sure that we get them answered. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nicoletti. All right, so um, today I'm going to be talking about open versus closed chain, um, closed kinetic chain exercise. Our conflict of interest statement here, um, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose and I will not discuss products in my presentation. So some objectives for this course. Oops. Are going to be um, differentiating between open and closed kinematic chain exercises. Kinetic chain exercises identify exercises appropriate for a patient or athlete's functional requirements and applying appropriate exercise progression based on strength, injury, acuity, and functional requirements. So let's start with definitions here. Open kinetic chain motion, or OKC. When the most distal part of a limb, usually a hand or foot, is moving freely in space and the proximal portion of that limb is fixed. So some examples of this would be um, elbow flexion or extension, knee flexion or extension, some functional motions uh, we can think about are kicking or throwing. Um, so some exercises here, for example, we've got ankle plantar flexion or dorsiflexion, 
biceps curls, leg extensions, bent over rows, all examples of an open kinetic chain. Some considerations when we're looking at prescribing OKC exercises. Um, so the motion is primarily happening in one joint. Uh, so going back to elbow or knee flexion or extension uh, with the elbow, it's the movement of the ulna around the humerus. With our knee, it's the movement of the tibia over the, on the femur. Um, so motions here are also typically just happening in one plane. Um, number two, so requires coupled activation of agonist and antagonistic muscles. Um, so for the elbow flexion and extension, we're looking at biceps and triceps. For the um, knee flexion and extension, we're looking at quads and hamstrings, of course. So they move, they activate together um, concentrically and eccentrically to help provide joint stability during that motion. Number three, um, this kind of exercise is better at generating a concentric contraction, meaning that the muscle is shortening and generating a force at the same time. Um, number four, joints undergo increased rotation and distraction forces. So if we break it down into our physics components here um, and principles, we're thinking about that joint as the axis of rotation and that moving bone or moving limb as our force vector or lever arm. Um, so that force is, is generating um, motion away from that access point, right? So we have more uh, rotation and distraction happening there. Number five, something to consider if we think again about that, the physics, you know, longer lever arm or higher resistance um, is going to increase the stress or torque on that joint or, or rotational axis. Um, so some, it's going to add sheer force to that joint. So something to consider as far as um, safety goes and joint health. And number six, this is going to be most of our upper extremity tasks, right? So this is um, just functionally the way we use and move our arms. So why would we choose um, an OKC exercise. So this number one, to isolate a single muscle or set of muscles. Number two, to isolate one joint. Um, number three, when an injury is acute or the, pot, the patient cannot tolerate loading body weight through that joint. Um, so this could be because of osteoarthritis, um, an acute ankle sprain, to protect a surgical repair. Um, so one example, when we're talking about surgical repairs, um, if you've got someone with a quad tendon tear and that's been repaired, oftentimes a prone hamstring curl, right? So an open kinetic chain uh, knee flexion is usually one of the first things that we do to protect that repair site and also to initiate some early motion. Um, and number four, for any sport specific motion such as kicking, punching, throwing, et cetera. Um, so this is, you know, thinking about our swimmers, our golfers, uh, boxers, our throwing athletes like baseball and softball, um, tennis, soccer, those kinds of things. So Next, we're looking at the closed kinetic chain, CKC motion. What does that mean? Um, that's when the most distal part of a limb, usually a hand or foot, is fixed to a stationary object and the proximal portion moves in relation to that fixed point. So some examples of this are going to be squats, push-ups, pull-ups, and lunges. So some considerations for um, CKC, for closed kinetic chain motions. Number one, so that motion is happening um, both at the proximal and distal joints. Um, so for example, with our squat, we're looking at motion at the hip, knee, and ankle primarily. Uh, if we're talking about push-ups, it's going to be looking at motions at the shoulder, elbow, and wrist. Um, this also means that motion can happen in multiple planes versus 
is just one for our open chain um, at various joints. So, you, you know, we're not, we're looking at motion happening in the transverse, plane, frontal, or sagittal. Number two, uh, complex sequential, sequential activation of several muscle groups. Um, because that, you know, of the involvement of all of those different joints, um, there's multiple muscle groups that are also working during those motions. Um, you, you're also going to have to consider that muscle activation is going to vary throughout that motion. Um, so, for example, you know, during that squat, your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings, your gastroc, your anterior tibialis even, are all going to be contracting and relaxing at various points during that full motion. Number three, reduces shear force and adds compression to joints. Okay, so almost the opposite of what happens during an OKC motion. Um, because of that weight bearing component, we've got compression to those joints and we've got less shear force happening there. Um, this is primarily due to the fact that that force, instead of concentrating on one joint, is spread out over multiple joints during that motion. Um, and so that helps to reduce the overall load on those areas. Um, the, the compression that a weight-bearing exercise or a closed kinetic chain exercise also adds some more stability to those joints. So also something to consider. Number four, produces a better eccentric contraction. So allows for um, improved ability to, for the muscle to lengthen and contract at the same time. Um, so this is occurring against gravity. A really good example of this is the, going down the stairs, right? So your quads have to elongate and contract at the same time against gravity while you're descending a flight of stairs to prevent falling. And number five, this is going to be most of our lower extremity tasks. So why choose closed kinetic chain? Number one, you can address multiple joints and multiple groups in one exercise, so more bang for your buck. Um, so this is a great way to kind of cover a lot of different bases and, and be really efficient with an exercise program. Number two, this increases joint stability and proprioception, so you know allows that patient or athlete to kind of have a better better feedback of where their body is in space because they've got that reference point of that stable surface underneath them or that, un, you know, that unchanging part. And number three, function, function, function. So um, closed kinetic chain exercises are usually more applicable for daily mobility, um, sport specificity um, compared to our open kinetic chain exercises. So what does the evidence tell us here? So looking at open kinetic chain, closed kinetic chain, and balance. Um, looked at two studies here. Number one, so the effect of open and closed kinetic chain exercises on dynamic balance ability of normal healthy adults. So they split these um, uh, participants into two groups. We've got open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain. Each group performed these exercises three times a week for six weeks, three sets of 10 repetitions at an 80% of their one rep max with two minutes of rest in between. Um, they used the good balance system, which is a force plate system uh, to measure their pre and post training, training performance. Uh, the conclusion of that study was that the closed kinetic gene group had a more significant improvement in balance as compared to the open kinetic chain group, right? That makes sense. Um, those receptors in all of our joints are getting better feedback when we've got our foot on the ground in a closed kinetic chain than open. They have more points of reference. Um, so the second study looked at here was the effects of closed and open kinetic chain exercise induced localized fatigue on static and dynamic balance and trained individuals. So this looked at um, 30 participants who are active and healthy. 
and again split them into two groups open and closed kinetic chain exercise um, measuring static and dynamic balance before and after um, so this study they used four sets of exercise to fatigue um, using their 60 60 percent of a one rep max with three minutes of rest in between um, what they found here was um, fatigue after open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain affects both static and dynamic balance. Um, open kinetic chain exercise had more of a negative effect than closed kinetic chain on that dynamic balance. Um, so what can we, what conclusions can we draw from both of these studies? Um, so closed kinetic chain should be used to improve dynamic balance uh, fat but fatigue is going to reduce that static and dynamic stability. So that's definitely something to be account for when you're issuing an exercise routine for a patient or an athlete. You want to consider, you know, the dosage of that exercise, the workout progression. Are they going to do this before or after um, they go out on the field and play? Um, and then how much rest are you giving these athletes in between? Uh, those are some important things to avoid injury. So OKC, CKC, and ACL rehab, okay, this is a big one, especially for our athletic population. Um, I looked at, at two uh, systematic reviews here. The first one um, looked at primarily the effects of anterior tibial laxity uh, postoperatively. So they had 10 studies that fit their criteria. The primary objective was to determine if early introduction of open kinetic chain quad strengthening affected ACL laxity. They also secondarily looked at strength, patient reported function, and physical function. So what they found here in these 10 studies um, is that among all graft types, there was low to moderate quality evidence suggesting no difference between the groups for introduction of open kinetic chain strengthening before six weeks and limited quality evidence of no difference in laxity between groups for introducing open kinetic chain exercises after six weeks. Um, so really, as long as you're in introducing open kinetic chain exercise, um, it didn't seem to significantly affect um, the laxity of the ACL repair. Um, what they did find, though, is that the patellograph seemed to be less vulnerable um, than the hamstring grafts. So they, there were two hamstring graft studies included in this systematic review. Um, each of them had a different protocol, um, one being more successful than the other in preventing laxity um, and suggesting that there's probably a specific range where open kinetic chain exercises can be performed safely and early in the rehab process. As far as um, strength goes, they found that early introduction of open kinetic chain exercise, so prior to six weeks, there was low to moderate quality evidence for no difference in strength outcomes at any point during the follow-up, and they looked at anywhere from um, less than 12 weeks to um, more than 12 months. For late open kinetic chain introduction, so after six weeks, there was um, limited evidence in strength changes um, as compared to early introduction at the short term and long term, so before 12 weeks and after 6 to 12 months, um, but they did show a significant increase in strength at the medium term follow-up, so 3 to 6 months. Um, they found that with both patient reported function and physical function, there was no difference between uh, the two groups of early or late introduction of open kinetic chain exercise. For the second systematic review here, there were 90 studies that fit the criteria. Um, this one looked at um, practice guidelines, so not just open and closed kinetic chain, but uh, um, other treatment approaches as well. So I kind of just pulled from what we're talking about here today, OKC and CKC exercise. Um, so they found level one evidence, so the strongest, um, our strongest level of evidence um, that both CKC and OKC exercise should be used to increase quad strength. 
um, they found level two evidence to suggest that OKC exercise can be used four weeks postoperatively in a restricted range of motion from 90 to 45 degrees. So this actually refers specifically to that hamstring study I had, hamstring graph study I had referenced earlier. Um, so this is um, a good guideline for anyone who's got a hamstring graft. Um, open kinetic chain exercise can be used pretty early on in the post-op rehab in that safe range of 90 to 45 degrees. They found also found level one evidence for closed kinetic chain eccentric quad strengthening, um, and that can be safely initiated anywhere up to three weeks postoperatively, um, and that they, they found that this was even more effective than concentric training. And the final piece here, level three evidence, um, that weight bearing, so closed kinetic chain again, right, is immediately postoperatively does not affect laxity and reduces the occurrence of anterior knee pain. Oops, going back to that quickly here. So, um, you know, just kind of taking the summation of both of these things here, both reviews, you know, concluded that open kinetic chain quad strengthening uh, for hamstring grafts may cause laxity if done, and if done so should be performed in a limited range of motion. Um, however, both agreed that open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain should be prescribed for the rehab process and will result in greater strength. Using this information from the practice guidelines and our previous studies on balance, um, we can conclude that closed kinetic chain should be emphasized to increase static and dynamic balance for greater functional outcomes um, and also has some really positive effects on um, strength and pain. And finally, here we look at the shoulder. So looking at open kinetic chain, closed kinetic chain exercises and um, shoulder performance. So the first one study here, we've got shoulder muscle activation patterns and levels um, differ between open and closed chain abduction. So this had 29 participants. They split them into one open kinetic chain group and one closed kinetic chain group performing specifically abduction um, at 25, 50, and 75% load. They also had um, measurements of seven different muscle groups or seven different muscles in the shoulder while this exercise was being performed. Um, what they found with this, so they were kind of looking at muscle performance and how it's necessary for the arthrokinematics of, of the joint um, and stability of the humerus. Um, so that, that, that they found that the open kinetic chain abduction is necessary to facilitate rotator cuff stabilization of the humeral head. Um, and that closed kinetic chain exercise may allow for full shoulder abduction earlier in the rehab process uh, because going back to our principles of closed kinetic chain uh, it provides greater stability for that joint, right, with that compression component. And there's less stress and torque on the rotator cuff muscles because that of that spreading out of those um, forces on multiple joints and multiple muscle groups. So for the second study here, they compared three different types of exercise for treating the rotator cuff uh, tendinopathy and or shoulder impingement. This was an RCT, randomized control trial. Um, they looked at three different groups performing open kinetic chain, closed kinetic chain, and range of motion exercises for six weeks. Um, what they found was that all groups had positive short-term changes. However, the closed kinetic chain group had the most meaningful reduction in pain and disability in the short term. So using these studies here, um, we can pull from this that both closed kinetic chain and open kinetic chain should be used for shoulder rehabilitation. Um, and closed kinetic chain may be more effective in gaining range of motion and reducing pain in the short term, so getting someone's mobility back early on in that rehab process. So next, we want to look at exercise prescription. Oops. Um, so some things to consider here, right? Um, first thing is, which stage of healing is this patient or athlete in? 
are, are they acute, subacute, or chronic? How irritable is their injury? Usually open kinetic chain is more, more appropriate for someone who is acute and irritable because there's less compression on that joint, um, but it's gonna depend, it always depends, right? Um, so the second thing here, to, or the third thing here to consider is, are they post-operative? Um, some protocols may dictate what is safe or appropriate for certain phases of rehab. Um, for example, um, you know, if we go back to our ACL re repair studies, we can start both open and closed kinetic chain exercises within three to six weeks of surgery. Um, other, other surgeries might require a little bit more time before you start certain phases of their exercise. Um, another thing to consider with exercise prescription is what was their activity level at baseline? So how strong are they already? Do they have appropriate body awareness? Um, if they were previously active and strong, more than likely they've pre got pretty good proprioception, kinesthesia, and balance, and might be able to perform a closed kinetic chain exercise more readily and safely than someone who is sedentary and weak. Another consideration here for exercise prescription is what other injuries or health conditions does this patient or athlete have? Is this an isolated injury? Does the patient have um, other issues that may affect their rehab? So for example here, you know, someone who's got a shoulder injury and a history of, of neck pain may need to start a little bit slower or require more attention to form and body mechanics than a person with an isolated shoulder issue. So along the same lines here, does the patient have sufficient strength and stability upstream and downstream? So I'm always encouraging um, my PTs and my new grads when I'm mentoring to assess you know, strength, mobility, and stability of the muscles and joints above and below the injury. Um, without addressing this big picture, you know, this person is more than likely gonna suffer a re-injury or another related injury. Um, you know, pairing off of the previous slide here, they're, they're more than likely going to have some deficits above or below where that injury is, especially if they've got a history um, of other injuries or if the injury is chronic or reoccurring. Most of the time you'll find that that patient or athlete has some weakness, some stiffness, some instability contributing to their current condition. Um, if they have issues above or below the injury, closed kinetic chain exercise may not be appropriate at first and will cause compensation in other areas. So you may need to start with someone with an open kinetic chain exercise and mobility work in those other areas at first to restore that function. Um, one example here, you know, if a patient is coming in for knee pain and you wanna get them going on squats, um, take a look at their ankle mobility, take a look at their hip strength. If they've got a stiff ankle and they don't have enough dorsiflexion to do that squat properly, they're gonna start to compensate up higher. You know, it's gonna cause some rotation in their knee, in their hip and lumbar spine, um, and it's gonna create some, some more asymmetries above that you're gonna to have to address eventually anyway. So with something like that, you might work on their ankle dorsiflexion along with that knee injury as well before they get into squats. So um, exercise progression. As far as um, exercise progression goes, the first thing we want to look at is assessing strength, range of motion, and flexibility. We wanna make sure that that patient or athlete is prepared to progress. So referring back to um, my, my previous concept here, upstream and downstream, you want to look at the injury site and then also above and below that. You know, do they, have, do they now have the sufficient strength and mobility for that next step? Um, you know, especially when we're thinking about transitioning from open kinetic chain to closed kinetic chain because we're going from isolating one joint or one muscle group to then working with multiple joints and multiple muscle groups. Um, so for example here, if they've got a shoulder injury, 
I'm going to look at their cervical mobility and stability. I'm going to look at their thoracic mobility and their core strength. Um, all really important things when we're looking at progressing someone through a program. You want to watch the quality of their motion. Um, are they compensating in any way or lacking um, in, a, in a peripheral area? Um, if so, then they're going to have a difficult time progressing to the next step. So when we talk about progression, you always want to start simple. Um, this can mean, usually means isolating a joint or muscle through an open kinetic chain exercise or starting with a very basic version of a closed kinetic chain exercise. Again, you want to watch the quality of their movement and you want to look for any compensation patterns. Um, you want to make sure they really have the mastery of those simple movements first. Um, if not, then down the road, it's going to lead to some problems later. If they're having to cheat their way through something, they're going to end up injuring something or creating some bad habits that are going to keep them coming back for treatment. Um, you want to look at <clears throat> that motion too. Is it well controlled? Um, or are they, you know, kind of using momentum or body weight or, or gravity to help them out with that? Compensation during a simple task will lead to even greater dysfunction and added with added complexity um, as you progress someone through exercise. Another consideration for progression here is starting stable and supported, right? As little as is required so the patient can learn the correct pattern and sequencing, but as much as is needed to complete the task without compensation and with good quality. So you want to get feedback from your, your patient or your athlete. Where are they feeling that muscle burn? Which muscles are getting tired? If their answer is not what you're expecting, then you definitely need to add some cues, some extra stability, some extra support to that task so that you're, you're getting the effects that you want, right? Um, always important to, to keep checking in with the, that athlete to make sure that they're feeling it where you want them to feel it. If you're starting with open kinetic chain exercises, once they have mastered those, you may need to bridge the gap um, for a closed kinetic chain exercise uh, through modification in order to preserve their form and prevent pain. So one example of this is, is a squat, right? Sometimes doing an unsupported air squat is going to be challenging for someone who, you know, maybe doesn't have great body awareness or doesn't have um, the strength yet, or, or maybe their, one of their joints, their knee or the hip, their ankle is still a little irritable. Um, so putting them on a leg press or a total gym, getting them against a wall or giving them a, a bench or something like that. So they've got the support, they've got that modification to offload those joints a little bit and, and give them that cue to, to um, promote better form. It's gonna be really helpful at first and then eventually you, you gradually take those supports away and those modifications. Um, another example is gonna be a push up, right? So having someone do that on flat ground on hands and toes is gonna be much more challenging than starting someone maybe on their knees or on an elevated surface until they've got the strength and also the patterning down so they can perform it with, with good quality. So other things, oops, other things to consider here um, are changing some of your variables when you're progressing someone through exercise. So I've listed um, a few here. Uh, first one is resistance. So you can increase that resistance. You can change the type of resistance, right? Dumbbells, barbells, elastic cords, med balls, kettlebells, we've got it all. Um, sometimes just changing what they're using can really uh, make a difference for people. Range of motion. So oftentimes I'll start someone with a limited range of motion if that's where they're pain free and then gradually increase that range, ideally to full range of motion um, as they heal and as they get stronger, right? Oftentimes with more strength comes greater access to that, that range of motion and that mobility. Um, muscles and joints are oftentimes the most vulnerable at those end ranges of the joint and end ranges of those muscle tissues where they're um, fully stretched or fully shortened. Um, 
and this is often where injuries happen, right? We think about like how someone um, sprains an ankle or or tears a ACL or meniscus. Um, so though that's really where you want to train someone. But you know, eventually when they're pain free and symptom free and and feeling pretty good, you can maximize that range of motion, get them to those end ranges. Um, and and really build strength through that entire range, um, in order to to prevent injury. Uh, third thing here is body position. So whether that's for stability, whether that's to work um, muscles against gravity or with gravity or function. Um, so when we're thinking about a body position progression. Um, supine, side-lying, prone, those are all going to be your most stable positions. Then quadruped, so hands and knees, getting someone then into sitting, kneeling, and then lastly standing, and even standing, you know, going from two legs to one leg. Um, so changing that position is going to um, challenge the muscles a little bit differently, take away some of their, um, the external stability, and require them to use more internal stability. Um, you can also change the body position to work the muscles a little bit differently. So we think about like an upright row versus a bent over row, um, those kinds of things. So the fourth thing here is going to be stability itself. So um, changing your base of support, like we talked about before, two feet versus one foot, um, adding a BOSU ball to make it more dynamic um, or some other unstable surface transitioning it from a static versus a dynamic exercise. Um, so for example, like a split lunge versus a walking lunge, those kinds of things can make it more challenging for people. So a couple examples here, I just wanted to you know, take people through um, maybe an example of how we would progress exercises for different injuries. So the first one here is an ankle sprain. Um, first thing we wanna make sure of is that we're regaining that range of motion. Oftentimes it's gonna be open kinetic chain um, exercises at first, right? Unweighted, um, no resistance to these, just making sure that they've got that full range of motion. Because um, you know, with a person who's got an acute ankle sprain, weight bearing is often very painful. They've got a lot of swelling in that joint. So compressing it even more isn't gonna feel that great. Um, oftentimes, you know, we want to also look at proximal weakness, right? So nine times out of 10, I've got, if someone's got some ankle st instability or ankle issues, they're going to have some hip weakness. They're both, you know, the multi-directional joints of our lower extremity. And so they both play off of each other as far as strength and stability go. Um, I'm going to look at, you know, where their hip strength is currently, and then probably pretty early on um, when they're not gonna be able to tolerate a lot on their ankle, I'm gonna address that weakness in their hip. Um, number two here, uh, second phase is gonna be adding some resistance to open kinetic chain uh, for strength and motor control. So making sure they've got a you know, nice smooth motion through any kind of resistance band exercise or um, exercises to make sure that they've got full range and full strength in that open kinetic chain, again, as they're healing and as weight bearing might not feel so good at first. So, you know, depending on how acute the injury is and, and how irritable it is, um, even dialing it back from an isotonic exercise to an isometric, where they're just creating that muscle contraction, there's not a lot of movement that's happening there. Then we would progress to some close kinetic chain, right? Once they can tolerate some weight bearing and that swelling has gone down, um, starting on two legs so that that weight is more evenly distributed and then progressing to one leg with full body weight. Um, and then of course, you're getting into um, plyometrics, two legs and one leg and then sport specific drills. Um, and always keeping in mind, being able to change um, the surface that it's happening on. So you know, starting with something flat and stable and then progressing to something that's, you know, more unstable, like a BOSU ball, a balance board, um, a BAPS board. So they've got some um, 
experience with unstable surfaces as well. That's really, especially when, when those ligaments are quite stretched out, going to be where they're going to find a lot of challenge. And again, always watching for the quality of their motion, right? If they're rolling, you know, inverting or rolling to the outside of their foot while they're doing some of this stuff, um, it's going to create some bad habits down the road and they're more than likely going to sprain again. Um, and most important for an ankle sprain patient, I find too, is, is or, or any lower extremity injury is going to be single leg stability and strength. That to me is where the magic happens. Um, if you think about, you know, all the things that we do throughout the day um, with our legs, you know, walking, stair climbing, um, getting into, you know, our, our athletes running, jumping, kicking, a lot of that is done, even if it's momentarily, it's on one leg, right? So having someone get as strong and as stable as they possibly can on that one leg is going to be really important down the road to prevent injury. So second example here that I wanted to give um, is going to be the rotator cuff tendonitis, tendinopathy, impingement. Um, so number one, you know, if they've got limited range of motion because of the impingement, we always want to restore that first, right? As we know shoulders are really prone to, to stiffness. Um, so restoring that pain-free range of motion, either with a closed kinetic chain exercise or open kinetic chain exercise, um, or both, combination of both, um, and address any surrounding limitations, right? So if they've got some cervical or thoracic stiffness that comes along with that, important to take a look at those things as well. Um, depending on how acute and irritable they are, this might mean that you have them perform it in a more stable position. I find sometimes someone's gonna be able to perform um, their range of motion without as much pain, whether they're in supine or side lying, and um, using a gravity for assistance or, or minimizing that gravity effect. You want to look at scapulothoracic and scapulohumeral mechanics, making sure that everything's moving properly um, as well as they're raising that arm up. Oftentimes we see those patients, you know, compensate with that upper trap muscle, they tend to start to elevate through that shoulder complex before they lift the arm up. And we want to see that um, move separately. You want to see them also be able to do all of that range of motion with good quality and no cheating, um, standing up first, right? That's the most functional. Then we're getting into some exercises, um, strengthening, um, starting at below shoulder level. So again, we're not, we're avoiding that painful arc. Um, this can be open kinetic chain. You can add some closed kinetic chain in there as well, as long as it's pain-free pain um, and depending on how irritable they are. And then we get into, you know, at or above shoulder level with those exercises, closed kinetic chain. Um, then you're, you're adding plyometrics and sport specific drills if appropriate. So, um, you know, this is especially important for all of our swimmers, our tennis players, golfers, um, our throwing athletes. They tend to have um, more irritable or at risk rotator cuffs. Okay, any questions? Hey, Naomi, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. It's something that I have read in the past about open kinetic chain. I have heard that it can put increased stress on the patellofemoral joint. What do you think about that if you have someone that comes to you with, you know, patellofemoral issues or tendonitis or what have you? Yeah, so that's certainly true if we, you know, if we think again back to the physics of that, um, you know, you've got that axis of rotation, you've got that lever arm, that long lever arm of your tibia. So if we're putting any weight on that, you know, it's going to create more um, stress and strain on that patella tendon at first. Um, certainly important to do some of that stuff down the road, maybe when they're less irritable. Um, but at first, kind of have to be careful with, with protecting that tendon um, if it's inflamed. 
Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I, you kind of covered it a little bit regarding like ACL repair. From what I've seen just in my time, that it's typically they start with open and go to closed kinetic chain. But I noticed in the studies you had mentioned that they had said that they both are pretty much similar. Have you seen any rehab kind of doing the reverse or essentially both at the same time post-op? Yeah, yeah. So that, you know, I was actually surprised to, to, to read about all of that. It was kind of fun to see our what we know conventionally, right? Um, traditional ACL rehab challenged. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'm keeping in mind for a lot of my athletes now is that we can start some of that closed kinetic chain exercise um, a little, little bit earlier on and it's pretty safe, right? Within reason, you know, they're going to be in their brace still and, and range of motion isn't going to be at full max. Um, but it's kind of nice to know that 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 stuff has some positive effects, not only on strength, but also they're going to have, you know, better proprioception because of that. And they're probably going to have um, less anterior knee pain, which is a common complaint in some of my uh, post-ops as far as uh, ACL repair goes. What have you been doing as far as getting those like ACL repairs that are in a brace? um regarding like closed kinetic chain exercises like essentially from the onset so um i'll usually start them in on we have a pilates reformer here so it's a very similar to a total gym um right where you're you're putting them horizontally right so it's just the resistance of the springs or whatever you know other resistance um you've got there and it, so we're not putting body weight through that joint. Um, you can control how much range of motion they're doing on there, and you can control um, how much resistance they're pushing against. Um, so that's a really good place to start with that because it's very gentle um, and it's not creating a lot of compressive force that we would see if they were doing like an upright squat. Okay. Um, a, a lot of the attendees on here are athletic trainers. So they do a lot of their own rehab with their athletes. What would you recommend if you, I mean, granted they're not gonna see direct post-op, but ankle sprains are huge. Um, what would you recommend? I know it's a range of motion, but can you give any like specific examples to kind of get them back out there and on the field? So um, if it's a fresh ankle sprain, you know, really acute, you just wanna get them moving first, right? So the alphabet, um, with their foot circles, that sort of thing, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Um, I would stay away from doing a lot of inversion at first because that's how they injured it in the first place, right? Usually most ankle sprains are inversion sprains. Um, so those ligaments are stretched out. Um, and then giving them some resisted open chain exercises to do with bands uh, usually is our first step. I really emphasize because especially kids, they want to get through their homework as soon as possible, right? So mm -hmm. with, with my um, my ankle sprains, I really encourage them and emphasize, you know, really slow movement. And, it, you know, it drives them crazy, but it's going to be really important down the road because they're building that strength. They're not using the um, the resistance of the band to really do the work for them, but they have to intentionally be activating those muscles. And then, you know, as soon as you can, you want to get that per that that athlete back up on their feet and especially on one foot. Um, practicing um, balance at, at any capacity, whether, you know, starting on a stable surface, progressing them to an unstable surface and then eventually, um, especially if they're an athlete, some plyometrics, you know, learning how to land safely um, on that one foot, you know, to to make sure that they have good quality of, uh, you know, in control doing that and it's not going to be painful for them. Okay. And for like preventative measures, I know a lot of people, you know, utilize some home physical therapy tools and one of them is the BOSU ball, which personally is the bane of my existence. But have you found that that has helped for preventative regarding, you know, these like ankle rehab or knee issues, or quad or what have you, lower extremity essentially? Yeah, yeah. So definitely um, using something like a BOSU ball. There's a lot you can even do um, at home on a flat surface um, just with some dynamic movement to 
to just build better body awareness, better balance, proprioception in those joints. Um, oftentimes that's where our injuries on the field happen, right, is when we don't have great awareness around wh what position our foot or ankle are in or what position our knee is in um, or having good control in those areas as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of that, any, anything you can do on one leg is going to help build not only the strength component, but the body awareness component that's going to be really important to keeping that person healthy and keeping them out of, uh, out of an injury. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I know you've answered a bunch of my questions. Um, it looks like we don't have any other questions. I'm just going to take over. I just got to put one slide up. Naomi, thank you so much. Um, it was awesome hearing from you with physical therapy and everything that you're doing. Keep up the good work over there. Okay. Sure. All right, everyone. I am going to just quickly um, change it on over here just to show my screen uh, just for some last minute business. You guys can see this. It's just one slide. Um, all right, so just just a few last minute stuff. Once again, you will receive um, an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation assessment. You'll have 72 hours to complete it to receive the CEU. Uh, just contact us with questions, journal club at relevesportsmedicine.com. Um, our next speaker will be on July 12th from 8 to 9 p.m. I know it's a little late, so grab some coffee. Um, with um, Andy Serafin, DPT. He is from Football Physios, and he will be speaking on soccer fitness and rehab. So all you soccer fans or athletic trainers, come tune in. Um, more opportunities to obtain live CU through the BOC, you can go to our website, uh, relevesportsmedicine.com, backslash journals, slash club, um, dash club. We are hiring uh, an ATC for clinic position, so please apply on the website. Again, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Take care.